So, uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about myself when I go to the Rock, Paper, Scissors presentation. Um, but just for those of you that aren't familiar, my background is primarily in more of the data space. Jeff is the... You want me to get you to the... Yeah, can you get me to the virtual environment so I can fire up Jupyter? Yeah. So, um, lightning talks for everybody's edification are talks that are generally about five to ten minutes long. This one may go a little bit longer than that. Um, I So, primarily the goal for tonight is to give a little bit of background on what random numbers are, how did you activate the environment? No, I didn't. Alright. We're having a lot of technical difficulties right now. There we go. Okay. So, random number generators are really useful in various uh, spaces within computer science and really just programming in general. Um, the primary use case for a random number generator is where you need some amount of randomness or you need to be able to select things essentially at random. One of the kind of use cases that everyone is familiar with. When you use iTunes Shuffle, the shuffling algorithm is randomly picking the songs. Now, that shuffling algorithm is a little bit more uh, in depth than what a lot of random, like, it's a little bit more in depth because it's going to maybe look at different things um, around user preferences, what songs you like, things of that nature. However, true random numbers are actually very difficult to generate. Uh, human can't, thank you. A human cannot actually generate a random number of sequence because we all have biases, we all have, um, we all have various things. So now that my technology is working, you know, what are random number generators? There are two classes of random jump number generators or devices that will generate these random sequences. The first one is a hardware which will actually generate a sequence of random numbers and the second one is pseudo-random number generators which look random, but are actually quite deterministic. So Python has built in the ability to generate random numbers. It's built into the standard library, it's random. And what we'll do is we generate, first off, we're gonna generate a random integer between zero and 10, so it picked eight. Now, the really cool thing about random number generators is that you can give it what's called a seed which then will cause that sequence to generate the same numbers over and over again. So what do I mean by seed? Well, this number is 10, for example. Now, if I run this code again, what you'll see is that the second number, second set of numbers, right there, the second set of numbers won't change. It's because every time that cell runs, it's essentially recalculating everything. So it's going to say, okay, the first... 10 random numbers that I'm going to generate are going to be that same sequence over and over and over again. That's because it's a seed. Um, seeds are really useful if you are generating various numbers or if you're trying to generate repeatable results. Let's say you have a simulation that's generating random numbers and you want to be able to run that simulation and then do repeatability uh, for like a presentation or something so you're not surprised. That's where you would use a seed value. So. What are some practical applications of random number generators? There are actually a lot of practical applications in addition to those listed above. Um, there are areas where we do want some randomness but we still want to be able to predict what that randomness is going to look like. Uh, for example, um, if you really, really, really need secure random number generators, you're better off going with the hardware. Python does have some uh, random number generator capabilities that are uh, considered cryptographically secure. However, the hardware is going to be your best bet. Now, <laughs> let's suppose that we wanted to generate, uh, let's say, 10,000 random numbers from the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution. I'm going to go ahead and import statistics to get the stats that I'm going to want. And I'm going to go ahead and write. Now, one thing that you're going to notice is that this mean. So here, I am saying use the random 
use the Gaussian distribution with mean zero and standard deviation. I'm going to generate 10,000 from, I'm going to pull 10,000 out of the Gaussian distribution randomly, and then I'm going to calculate the mean and standard deviation. Now, you'll notice that that number is kind of close to zero, that other number is kind of close to one. Not exact, but kind of. What is going to happen though, for example, if I changed this to generate that many numbers? What you'll see is A, it's going to take a while, and B, it's going to take a while to compute the mean and the standard deviation. Those numbers should be closer to one, 0 and 1, which you're getting actually pretty close. So, um, the interesting thing, and this is from stats, if anybody actually, if anybody remembers statistics, which is that your Gaussian distribution, your normal distribution with zero, mean zero and standard deviation one, um, using like the central limit theorem, or not central limit theorem, um, forget which theorem, which theorem is not central limit though, but using one of the theorems from statistics, you'll know that the point estimate, so the mean, will actually converge to the distribution's true mean as n tends towards infinity. And so what we're seeing here is we're actually seeing that play out from a numerical standpoint. Now, um, everyone is familiar with the standard IQ data points, which are a measure of the ability to learn. Uh, population mean for IQ is 100, standard deviation is 10. Now, let's say that we have 100,000 people, and we want to randomly pull 100 people to sample and see what their data looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and generate this data here. We're going to generate our population data. We're going to use the normal variant, which is the normal distribution, just under a different name. So the random number package actually has two different functions to generate data from a normal distribution. You have the Gaussian, and then you have the normal variant. Um, in the docs, it actually says the Gaussian is slightly faster. So we're going to use the population mean, the standard deviation, um, this underscore here, so all this is saying is iterate over the range that's given, so it'll iterate uh, 10,000 times, and the underscore is just throwaway variable, which is kind of nice, because I don't need it for anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and generate my data, and what you're going to see is these are the first 10 data points right here, and then Oh, sorry. Hold on. Okay, so these are the first 10 data points, the population, and then I'm going to, from random.sample, I'm going to grab 100 data points, just randomly grab 100 data points, and then using the sample data, I'm going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Now, in data science in particular, you may have, you'll have training sets, you'll have, I'm sorry, you'll have the complete training set and you may then randomly pull out a testing data set to kind of lay off to the side. You could do something similar for this. Um, I know within the work that I do, occasionally uh, we'll pull random samples from populations to just keep rerunning the algorithm on. So um, that's just something useful. It's built straight into the standard library. You don't need anything too extravagant for it. Um, now, there we go. So the other kind of interesting use for a random number generator is to randomly generate a quote for each day. Um, these are quotations that I just pulled offline. I thought they were kind of funny, so I pulled them. The first one is what I thought was actually really funny about the best measure is uh, an income tax return. So what this is doing is uh, random.choice is pulling from one of the quotations and it's using the uniform distribution and it's just going to say give me a number between I'm going to return the result. So something that's kind of interesting is this context of a randomness extractor. So pseudo random number generators are by definition deterministic. However, something that's interesting is that using a mathematical function we can take that mathematical function, apply it to a weekly random data source, and what we'll find out, or what we'll get, is we'll get something that looks highly random and is uniformly distributed, independent of the source. So what do I mean by that? Well, the 
uh, primary extractor that we're going to use is called the Von Neumann extractor, which is the most, one of the earliest and basic randomness extractors. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a function that will randomly generate a list for me. And you'll notice that I did here is type and annotations. So, this is something that's new in a, a Python 3. I can't remember which version they introduced it. But type and annotations do a couple interesting things. One, um, it kind of helps move the code more towards a statically typed um, code base. And two, using type and annotations, your uh, IDE or development environment will actually be able to read and then infer what it should be presenting you. So, kind of nice. It's also nicer for the users. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate so here uh, we're just going to generate 10 100,000 I think yeah 100,000 data 100,000 data point sequence and then just for fun I calculated the mean and the standard deviation. Um, the reason I calculated the mean is I wanted it to be around 0.5. Um, 0.5 is the Bernoulli uh, for Bernoulli experiments of either zero or one is generally the ideal one. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a von Neumann extractor. And what that does is it takes a look at its uh, sequence of bits. And it looks at the first and the second bit in the sequence, and it determines are they the same, yes or no. And if they're the same, then I'm going to return back the bits. So just something that's interesting here is I'm going to go ahead and run this. Uh, it took 10,000 and then pared it down to 5,000. List. So this is interesting. So I actually used the zip method that Jeff was talking about earlier to compute my paired list. And what I'm essentially doing is I'm taking the sequence, iterating over it, and producing a paired list. Okay, so here's my von Neumann sequence. So there's my paired list, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, etc. And what I'm doing is, excuse me, I am taking these values, and I'm saying, okay, one zero is the zero one two. So, as everyone probably is aware, Python counts starts counting lists from zero. So, if I actually did the von Neumann, Neumann filter, and let's say that I applied it to Paired list zero, I should, if I wrote my code correctly, get an error. Okay. So now here I'm going to get none back because they're the same, which is what should happen. So I'm going to go ahead and generate a new sequence. And I'm going to take the von Neumann filter, and any element that is returned by the von Neumann filter, I am going to take that integer, and I'm going to convert it to, I'm going to take the bits, and I'm going to convert it into a binary. So an integer base two, basically. Where the von Neumann filter actually returns something. And what I'm going to get back is a list of twos and ones and twos. And I'm going to get back from that initial list of 50,000, I get back 25,000 data points. And when I do the calculations, I now have a mean of 1.5 and a standard deviation of 0.5, which is kind of interesting. Um, so basically, the, the randomness filters are an interesting application of random number generators because they would allow you to take a weekly random sequence and then convert it into a sequence that has more randomness. This is probably not necessarily the most robust example, um, but it is an example of what the von Neumann filter looks like. Which package is having the von Neumann filter function? The what? Which package is having the... Oh, um, I built it. Oh, Sorry, cool. it's right here. I just added it. Um, so it's just the von Neumann filter. Takes in two bits, joins them together if the values are not equal, or else it's going to return them. Um, so it's a function that I built right there to do the comparison for me. Um, that's one of the nice things about Jupyter Notebooks is you can actually build 
your almost your analysis or your functions into the notebooks. Um, the downside though to doing that is this is not exposable anywhere. Like I can't just say, oh, I'm going to import from um, the von Neumann filter. Um, kind of one of the, in my mind, uh, one of the really interesting aspects of random number generation, in addition to it being an interesting way to test your data, um, is in the use of test casing. Or, sorry, in the use case of testing. So when you think about testing, um, one of the things that people talk about is, oh, it works in the unit test. Well, that's probably because your unit tests were under carefully contrived conditions. Uh, if you use random number generators and it's numerical operations, then you can really get a test case and you can really understand that better. So, any other questions? Before we go on to the really fun part? Or my mind the fun part? Only once, it's going twice. Sold the die is better. So, So the next Jeff, are you gonna be logged into Google Drive? Mm -hmm. Maybe. So I... <coughs> Actually, it's just my UNO drive, not a big deal. Okay, I was like, wait, do I need to... Actually here's another deal. Uh, what's your If I was clever, I would have remembered to put equipment. Let's see if that works. You know why I need to see if I'm here? So for the rock, paper, scissors, I have a couple slides that I'll show beforehand. And then we'll dig into it. So for the next uh, portion that I wanted to look at was um, actually starting to look at what it would take to build out a game that played rock, paper, scissors. Don't refer, I am not fishing you, okay? <laughs> not today. It's because I was fishing yeah. yesterday. It's not going to actually get again today. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and present. So, building an interactive game. Um, oh, so I guess who am I first? Uh, obviously, as you probably know, my name is Matthew Blake McCary. Um, that is my younger daughter, Charlotte, who, like my older daughter, likes taking selfies. Um, for the past eight years or so, I've been doing um, either Python, SQL, some sort of data engineering tasks, those sorts of things. Um, my <laughs> educational background is in mathematics, but I am pretty much entirely self-taught when it comes to databases, data engineering, uh, software development. Currently, I am a uh, software developer for a healthcare company called Alidate. Um, kind of our main mission is to help primary care providers remain independent. So that's kind of cool. Um, email if you want to talk to me afterwards. You can hit me up on Twitter, and you can follow GitHub, where I post random things from time to time. So, what is rock, paper, scissors? I'm going to assume everybody knows what rock, paper, scissors is. But if you don't, it's a two-player game that is simultaneously played. And the available actions are rock, paper, and scissors. This is not rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, because I can't remember the strategies. So, um, if you think about rock, paper, scissors, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and paper beats rock. Now, let's think about this from a game theory perspective. You see, I'm a mathematical person, so I like game theory. Um, game theory, for everybody that doesn't know, or for those that do, it's the application of mathematical models to strategic decisions. And the reason why I bring this up 
is because there is a concept in game theory called the Nash Equilibrium. And the Nash Equilibrium says that there is a strategy that you should play that is the best response to the strategy the other person is playing. Now, this is the what's called the game matrix, or I think it's like the standard form or something for the game. And you'll see that it's rock, rock. Rock, paper, scissors, maybe? Yeah, let's say it's rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors. Um, I think that's right. So, the idea behind a Nash equilibrium is that that is your best response, that's your best strategy. Um, now, and like anything in mathematics, you can have three, or you can have really three cases or th four cases for a Nash equilibrium. You can have one pure Nash equilibrium, which says that there's always the best action. You can have one mixed and no pure, which says that your best action is to select from these choices randomly with certain probabilities. You can have multiple pure Nash equilibriums or you can have multiple pure and mixed Nash equilibriums. Now, is anybody familiar with the prisoner's dilemma? Nobody know what that is. How many people don't know what that is? Okay, so the prisoner's dilemma is a game where you and another person are both arrested for the same crime. And let's say a DA or a police officer walks in and they say, you have two options, confess or don't confess. If you don't confess and the other person confesses, you get off scot-free. If you confess and the other person confesses, there's reduced jail time. If the other person doesn't confess and other person doesn't confess and you confess, you're going to go to jail for longer. And the prisoner's dilemma, there is there is a Nash equilibrium, which is you always confess. Because that is the strategy that guarantees you the least amount of prison time. Now you might think, huh, maybe I shouldn't confess. The problem is, if you don't confess, the other person does, oh, sorry, if neither one of you confesses, you both walk free. The problem though, is that if you don't confess, and the other person can, if you don't confess, if you don't confess, and the other person, anyways, the, <laughs> I've gotten myself mixed up, but for the Nash equilibrium and the prisoner's dilemma, both players need to confess in order for them to get the payoff that is the, their guaranteed best payoff. And that is because you can't count on the other person not to confess, basically. So, the idea though is that rock, when we think about rock, paper, scissors, since it's a repeated game, your Nash equilibrium is not to always play, there can't be one pure Nash equilibrium. Because if you start playing rock all the time, the other person is just going to play paper. If you start playing scissors, the other person is always just going to play rock. So, the interesting thing is that rock, paper, scissors falls into the second category where there is only one non, sorry, there are no pure Nash equilibriums and one mixed Nash equilibrium. Now, if we think about what the mixed Nash equilibrium is going to be, that it is almost always in your best interest to play either rock, paper, or scissors uniformly, so one third. That means that your mixed Nash equilibrium is probably going to be about one third for each of these. And the, however, the Nash equilibrium is not really useful here. And that's because people play this game over and over and over and over again. I mean, my wife and I play the game just to, to see who's going to change diapers. She generally beats me, which makes me sad because I don't like changing diapers very much. So what are we going to try to accomplish in the next, let's say, 30 minutes? What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to build out a basic rock, paper, scissors game that can be played via the command line. And then if we have the time, then we'll add the ability for two bots to play the game. And if we have even more time, then we'll add the ability for you to select a strategy. But to get started, I'm going to go to Jeff's code. Can I just create a new folder somewhere? Yeah. Do you care where it ends up? 
Mm, no. Because you can just delete it later. Thunder, thunder, and then thunder, thunder. There we go. Uh, I'm going to say, a new file, I'm going to call it game.py. So, Within rock, paper, scissors, there are a couple interesting things about the way that you can code Python. There are probably a million different ways to slice this shit, or slice the cat. Right, skin the cat is one. So let's go ahead and the, the basic object in rock, paper, scissors is going to be your game. And there are three different options for your game, or choices, if you will. So, the cool thing that we can do within Python, they have the concept of an enum, or an enumerated class. So, we're going to have rock as a choice, paper as a choice, and scissors as a choice. So, the really cool thing about that, Perfect. Okay, so the reason why this import game works is because when you enter into a shell or a REPL of Python, which is what I've entered into, it adds your current working directory to the Python path. So it'll always search your current working directory first. So if I were to say choice, so I could do game.choice.rock, it should be. why live coding is never encouraged. There's a VS Code extension which lets you pre-record live coding sessions. See, and that would have been smart because I forgot to bring the adapter, which is actually kind of nice because I have all the code written on this side of the screen so I can click here. Anyways. So this is saying, okay, now I'm going to choose rock. Now, obviously it's not much use unless we have a way to determine who beats whom. So we probably need beats function. And we're going to say player. Oops. Call it P1, and that's a choice. P2, and that's a choice. And then um, what should our function return? True or false? Yeah. So you can either return one or two, um, so say player one or player two. You could say that the beats is going to be from the perspective of player one, so we're either going to return true or false depending on who wins. Uh, is there a consensus as to what anybody wants to return? All right, we're just going to return it. Using int rather than bool makes it easier to add more players in the future. You could, yeah. If, oh, wait, players, that's not the right kind. I was going to say, like the know. lizard and Spock. Yeah, I guess if you did that, you could have a three way. Anyways, uh, three way game. Uh, returns one if player one wins, otherwise. So, um, the options here are so if player one and player two both submit the same choice, nobody wins. That's pretty easy.
Now, this is generally just me being a stylistic or my pet peeve. I always like to get the condition where we're going to return none out of the way first because we're not going to execute anything else. However, now, this is the fun part. So, everybody knows rock, paper, scissors, shoot, scissors, beads, paper. Um, so, what we're going to do is we're going to return if p1, p2, we're going to come up, so what we need to do is we need to come up with a list of enumerated values where player one, so, uh, <coughs> yeah, so for rock, paper, scissors, instead of giving rock the value of zero, mm -hmm. If you give rock the value of 2, scissors the value of 1, and paper the value of 0, if you compare the value of the inputs, like if the, if the user 1 gives uh -huh. rock and the pair uh -huh. 1 gives scissors, if the value of one pair is greater than another pair, obviously this pair is going to be there. So, sorry, so you would give rock 2. Rock 2, scissor 1, and paper as 0. Because rock and paper, rock is going to win. Scissor and paper, scissor is going to win. Rock and, pa and uh, paper and scissor, scissor is going to win. So, so if the value of any input is greater than another input, then it's going to win. Rock beats scissors. But paper beats rock. Paper beats rock or rock, pa rock beats paper, right? Rock and paper beats rock. rock. Paper beats rock. Paper beats rock. Yes. That's the restaurant. Uh, I thought like rock will go inside the paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Uh, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. So it's like a circular. Nobody knows why paper beats rock, it just does. I mean, if you watch the YouTube video about rock, paper, scissors, rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, they have like this whole song about it. Like I said, I'm a nerd in that way. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a list of tuples, choice.rock. This is the nice thing about using a news as well. So, you want to notice choice.paper. So, rock beats paper, or paper beats rock. Ah. Scissors beats paper. It's a really nice, efficient way to use like a mod, the modulus command this. Is there? Yes. No, I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but I just remember learning that and then looking at that code and it's like, that's really, it's really nice and simple. So. Uh, you know, I am positive there is a much more efficient way to do this. I just don't know what it is. Okay. So. What we're going to do now is from yeah, I know we were in anatomy. There we go. Okay, so this is just a shortcut from imp import reload, even though um, it's being deprecated in Python as mad at me. Uh, what it does is it allows you to reload the module. So anytime. You, so if you did like import game again, it wouldn't do anything because you already imported the module. So reload basically will re-import the module for you, so it was clean. So what I can do is I'm going to say p1 equals game.choice.rock, p2 equals game.choice.paper, and I'm going to say beats p1, p2. So now player one and one, because rock beats paper. No, paper beats rock. Not in. There we go.
maybe try redefining the player choices? I think the second choice paper beats, scissor beats paper, right? Second choice. This one? Yeah. Paper beat. Oh, rock beat. Paper, paper beats rock, rock scissor, scissor beats paper. Second rock choice rock is win. Okay. Oh, is it? No, player two should win. Debugging. Yes. Okay, so what it's saying now is aha. So it's saying, yeah, rock and paper are in there. I don't know how tuples work exactly. Uh, so tuples are ordered. So ordering is important in tuples. P1, P2, not in rock paper. In rock paper. So if you're in, then you played rock and that person played paper. So player two should win. Else, player one. Sorry, that was good. Happens. Python three. Okay. So, um, rock. Boom. And player two wins. So it's supposed to happen. So the major issue that I had was I flipped the conditional so that now what we're saying is that if player one and player two are in these three categories, player two wins. Else player one wins. So let's try another one. Game dot beats choice dot. Anybody want to throw one out? Rock. Player two. Scissors. Okay. Rock beat scissors. Everyone. Perfect. All right. So we can get rid of live debugging. Which actually brings me to my next thought, which is debugging is actually a good thing. And yeah. It, how many people are familiar with Python's logging library? Anybody? User? Perfect. Okay, so Python has this really nice built-in logging library. And you're going to have to ignore the little bit of voodoo that I'm doing right now. Okay, so a couple key things here. Um, so I imported the sys module, which gives me access to the standard out, which is basically the command line. And then I'm from logging, so I'm importing the logging. And this basic config right here, uh, what that does is it's just a do, way to do a basic configuration if you just need to log on the fly. Typically, in production practices, you would have 
a logging configuration that is stored in a file, and this is of Django, or you may actually read in your logging configuration from environmental variables. Uh, and so here is the logger that we're getting. Now, here's what we can do is we can say uh, logger dot debug. This will give you back is it'll give you back what player one and player two chose. So. so now what you'll notice is we're actually getting back these debug commands, which are actually fairly useful now. In a production environment or really any other environment, you would set the logging level to a higher logging. So a debug info warning error then exception. Um, so if I wanted to, if I was just writing this on like a server, I wouldn't log at a debug level because you get all of these really inane messages. So what we're gonna do is two lines for the new function call, and then we're gonna say, great, now we know who wins, but we really don't know how to play the game. So, in order to play the game, what we need to do, since I am going to assume that it has to be a simultaneous game, which means that you are going to be playing against the computer. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have player one choice, which is going to be a choice object. And for this, we're just going to return That will tell me whether or not I will die. Okay. So plays the game and tells you if you want. So how should we tell the computer what to pick? So this is, so the random dot choice operates on an interval. Now the nice thing is that when you say for an enumerated object, when you give it to a list, it's going to return all of the list is going to be populated with all of the enumerated values. So, boom. So now random is going to pick one of those with uniform distribution, approximately. Yeah, I actually also find it useful that because I didn't know that you could apply the list function to an enum. Yes. To just get everything out of it. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. It's actually really useful. Uh, enums are really useful if you need to be able to cast a value to a string or a number, sorry. Or if you really want to be able to say, um, I always want rock, but I don't have to worry about spelling. You just want to check in a list of enumerated values. Because uh, I think no idea if that's yeah, that'll work. So I can actually say is the ro is rock in my enumerated choices, which is kind of contrite because it's or redundant because it's obviously going to be in there. Um, so, I can go ahead and say if return beats uh, my choice. Ah. And then the comp choice double equals one. So, the nice thing about actually the return statement 
is it will actually evaluate whatever you're trying to return before it returns it. So it's going to say return beats, and if that if the return value from beats equals one, then I'm going to return true. So if I reload game, then I say game dot play game uh, game dot choice dot rock. Got none. So now it's saying, okay, you chose rocker, you chose rock, player two chose paper. I'm going to choose rock again. So now it's kind of, you're kind of starting to see a pattern here. Um, but, you know, this really, like playing it in the REPL is interesting, but I kind of like an opponent that will talk to me. I don't know if you can pass by a computer and an opponent that will talk to you, but. So if you do if dunder dunder name equals double equals dunder dunder main. So this is something. Um, I don't know Java or really any other language well enough to be able to say how this would work in other languages, but um, <coughs> Python. So in Python, if you were to actually run this whole script from the bash interface or from your command line or terminal window, it will actually go through the script and execute every single line of code, which is both good and bad. If you actually import it, so if I were to import game as well uh, from the REPL, it will go through and execute every line of code. Now, if you have uh, a function, or if you just have a bunch of code at the bottom that's actually doing something, like making a database call and truncating a table, when you go to import that module, it's going to make the database call and truncate the table, which is a bad thing. Same thing here, if you did some sort of destructive operation, not wrapped in a function, it would do that. But this if dunder name equals dunder main, what that does is it says, okay, if you're calling me from the bash or from your terminal or from the command line, then I will actually execute this code. So we're going to say print hello user. Did I forget something? Yes, thank you. All right. So we're going to say if uh, response dot start with So what we're going to say is, okay, if you didn't give me a Y or a yes, I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, just to check.
try Python 3 here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now let's actually play the game. Um, so let's say that you have a little bit of a interesting computer, and it's going to ask you how many rounds you want to play the game, because obviously no one wants to play the game once. Now, when the user is entering their uh, moves, we don't really have a way, currently at least, to take rock, paper, scissors, enum, and map it over to what the user would want to input. So, what we'll want to do is we're going to want to create a module level variable, or in a sense a global variable in this case, called choice map. I know global variables are bad, says some people. So, rock. Paper, choice.paper. Now, so this mapping essentially, or my choice.map, or my choice map, is a dictionary. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to say if move not in choice. So if it's not in choice.maps, try again, either else, we're going to say player choice. Now here's the, here's the good thing, is I can do pass that player choice object into my result function which will either tell me yay or nay. I'm going to say if result print you win Alright, I win. Call, it, call this a personal preference. Yeah. But um, so one if the choices are equal if rock if the Player chooses rock and computer chooses rock as well. Uh huh. I would almost be tempted to go into a loop and to play and automatically trigger a new game at that point. And secondly, after each game, as, as opposed to defining the count of games initially, after each game, the player is prompted, hey, do you want to continue or exit? You, you could do a that. personal preference. Yeah. I wonder if, which would be more efficient. Um, I think you can use it loop. Yeah, I mean, you can use a while loop either way. Uh, if you, honestly, so when I was writing this code originally, I had it set up so that it would just keep asking you over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, and this is, again, personal preference, the way that I play the game, at least at home, is we play three or best of three or best of five. Fair enough. Which doesn't matter here because you're playing three or five. Um, yeah, you could just, you could do the while loop so that it would just keep playing and it would just, if you say yes, I don't want, or no, I don't want to continue, it'll break out of the loop. Um, that would actually be fairly simple to do. Uh, let me finish coding kind of a game counter, and then I'll make me that one for you. Oh, no, no need. If this works, this works. This also prevents the uh, infinite loop problem. Then we're going to say, oops. so once we exit the while loop, the computer might be a little nice since they say thanks for playing. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, you could do the infinite while loops that just kept playing. Also, I think when I was testing this, I got a little annoyed it kept having to keep having to hit Y. Because, like, yes, I keep, like, want to keep playing. I guess you could change it though so that if your right. choice was after three, after three games, it will prompt you, do you want to keep playing? Right? Yeah. Or you five games, what have you. Yeah. It'd be really simple, actually. So, yes, I want to play a game. You want to play a game? Yes, I want to play a game. Ah, that's the problem. Play a game, Clarice. There we go. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna play a game. Let's play five rounds. Oh, no, because he didn't win all the time, so I won once. Aha! Oh, by the way, this is that uh, plus equals operator that Jeff was mentioning earlier. Yeah, I want to play a game. Play three rounds. I won one. Now you could, if you wanted to, you could also say, okay, let's play five rounds. Let's play the best of five. So you could have a second. You could have another question in there that says. Um, how many, do you want to play a number of rounds? If you don't give anything, then it's going to assume you want to play an infinite number of rounds. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to play a game, play a game. Um, so if you wanted to say, do you want to play uh, best of, how many rounds shall we play? And then we can add another uh, input that says best of, and that will be input. And I'm really just doing this to be able to check my logic real quick. Okay, perfect. So the logic works. So now we can say best of. Um, so if you win, if you want to do best of, then you have to win more than half the games. So how would we do this? How do you guys think we should implement best of? Sorry, what did you say? Divided by two number of games, total number of games divided by two, uh, float dip by two, and if it is greater, then he wants float dip like two slash. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Greater than win count? Yeah. So, I mean, that's how you can implement a really basic CLI game, or just a really basic game. Now, uh, we're almost out of time, but what I'll do is I'll post both sets of code up into the uh, Omaha Python user group uh, meetup. So, in the meetup, we have 
I guess just a housekeeping note. In the meetup, we are sorry. In the Omaha Python user group on GitHub, we have several different uh, repos that are running. One of them is the tutorials repo where we post all of this stuff. So if anybody wants to give a talk or anything, hit me up afterwards. Um, and please do, because if you don't, then you have to listen to me talk again next month. And, and me. And him, potentially. Um, and we can be very boring presenters. So, um, yeah, so I'll post all of this code up there. If you feel free, if you want to expand upon it, if you want to build something, and then push it on in using a PR. Um, yeah, otherwise, Thanks for coming, and thank you to our host, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yeah.